this is on a similar lane. Look, I think Fauci is just an example of somebody who's trying to do their job. I mean, this is his job. I don't, I mean, he, the, the, I, I appreciate the work he's doing and it's great. And obviously he needs to be protected from the psychopaths that are trying to destroy him, but he's also so valorized because we have, you know, completely gutted. We don't even have a reference point for just sort of like basic gut public good provision governance. So a guy who's affiliated with the federal government saying, yeah, let's not, um, do a real time immune system experiment with the millions of students, Senator Paul. Um, Maybe instead of that, we should just hang out for another couple of months, save some lives. This stuff stands out. Um, And and frankly, at this point, his courage does stand out because he's under fire um, from so many obscene people. Here's Donald Trump uh, directly going against him, saying that that answer about reopening the schools, about not putting children across the country's health in jeopardy, yeah, it's unacceptable. Dr. Fauci is playing both sides. Are you suggesting that the advice well, he's giving you is I was different? surprised by his answer, actually, uh, because, uh, you know, uh, it's just, to me, it's not an acceptable answer, especially when it comes to schools. The only thing that would be acceptable, as I said, is professors, teachers, etc., over a certain age. I think they ought to take it easy for another few weeks, five weeks, four weeks, who knows, whatever it may be. But I think they have to be careful because... This is a a disease that attacks age, and it attacks health. And if you have a heart problem, if you have diabetes, if you're a certain age, uh, it's certainly uh, much more dangerous. But with the young children, I mean, uh, and students, it's really, it's uh, just take a look at the statistics. It's pretty amazing. Mr. President, businesses are concerned. So, I mean, of course we know, I mean, first of all, as we always, always, always point out, those students will very likely have interaction with people in the higher risk groups at one time or another. You don't, you can't just sort of magically wall off major sections of society. And then the other thing is, is that we don't know. I mean, we, we know very basic, obvious things, right? We do, of course, if you, we know that there are preconditions that in general, uh, would make you more susceptible basically to everything. So I don't even I don't even know how clarifying that particular bit of information is at this point, frankly. Yeah. In general, if you're older, if you have a condition like diabetes, you are at m- more risk for many things, including, in fact, a common flu, which all these assholes were saying it was a couple of months ago when things were just sailing. Uh, so... We've, I've seen reports in New York, as I always say, I'm very reticent to, you know, get into the details with this without specifically talking to somebody in epidemiology or medicine, but there's reporting around some school kids in New York getting uh, uh, sick in ways that I think they are linking to the virus that are horrifying and deeply disturbing. There's definitely people in, you know, 20s and 30s uh, and 40s who are in, you know, don't have uh, pre-existing conditions who have died from this. And by the way, this is a hard, like even the people that you have known or I have known, I should say, who recovered described like the worst physical experience they've ever had in their lives for a couple of weeks. And you want to deploy that potentially in a, let's say really conservative, let's say, a couple hundred thousand students nationally, kids get this for absolutely no reason because we're rushing open because Republicans all of a sudden care about public education. Uh, wh- why? And, that, yeah. and that's a burden on the healthcare system as well. I mean, pediatricians yes. across the country dealing with an outbreak of kids who cannot breathe, having asthma plus symptoms and everything else and then going into already overcrowded hospitals and maybe making it more dangerous for, as an example, somebody who doesn't have Corona, but has symptoms related to diabetes. I mean, one of the horrible things that happened in New York, I'm sure it happened elsewhere, but I could tell you stories that I know of, you know, personally that are nightmares of 
people in those risk categories that needed to go get medical attention because of something that they were dealing with. And then basically, con I mean, by all, everything you could tell, you know, contracting the virus at the hospital. So, I, I mean, whatever, it's obscene. We just need to chronicle this stuff. It, you know, there's, there isn't really that much analysis to it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's basically I mean, where it's a, a journalistic obligation to just catalog it. Um, but yeah. And also well, to just, the, he has the one speed of making this a political issue. Like imagine going to a doctor and they're like, well, it looks like you have cancer and you're just like, that's an unacceptable answer. Unacceptable. Doctor. <laughs> okay. Not even like, I'm going to get a second opinion. I'm like, that's unacceptable. Yeah. And what, about this. what Fauci said was to Rand Paul, like, we shouldn't be cavalier with child children's health right. because we don't know enough yet. It's like, yes. we can be cavalier. What do you yeah. call them? The Cleveland Cavaliers if you can't yeah. be cavalier for I was very surprised that he said that we couldn't be cavalier with children's health. Yeah. I think there is some analysis to this because most people can understand on a very visceral and intuitive level that it is the wrong call to make decisions uh, that will kill people just to prop up this imaginary, uh, this, this abstract yet very real thing that controls all of us called the economy. They can't shut down for a month. What the hell is going on? And hopefully this will cause some people to question the underlying assumptions of this system and the wisdom of having such a thing where if people stop going to work for a month, the entire world collapses. Yeah. Oh, we've definitely talked about that a lot. And that's, that's, that's definitely true. And I think, you know, the, the distinction to be made um, with regards to this particular Republican variant is there, there's the big picture and Thomas Friedman started this several weeks ago with the upmarket version of like, Hey, maybe we can get back to work. Maybe, maybe, I don't know. I'm just picking randomly here. Maybe it'd be good if people could get back to Foot Locker. Um, uh, and and certainly the Democrats doing nothing systemically, even in this heroes bill that we went into yesterday, uh, to address people's needs. The, what Trump is pushing, and I'm sure that Trump, you know, had he wants to juice the stock market. He has a very specific short time frame and anxiety around it. But even from you know purely cold macroeconomic advice, like yes, you want some activities to resume. And by the way, you're already seeing, I mean, you know, Amazon and other places are doing great. You don't really want, you know, if I, if I'm just looking at this purely economically, I don't think I want schools running again, driving up a budget, you know, like wasting money, causing a burden to the health system, I don't necessarily want a million businesses functioning at a loss that are just going to fold anyways. And I think this is where, of course, it's connected to material conditions. Of course, Republican governors, their primary motivation is they don't want to pay unemployment benefits. And they absolutely want to use this to, to discipline the workforce and cut the social safety net and all the rest of it. But this Republican like there is like a specific death cult variant on this because pushing to open the schools very specifically does not make economic sense. Well, you know what? Does it does not is, make logistical they're, sense. They're in it a double not, bind. It does well, not make logistical sense. It, it makes coercion of labor sense though, because yes. as soon as you open those schools again, all of a sudden those parents don't have the excuse of, I can't yeah, get back to work. And get those are work. those. Like right. that's the part of the economy. That's the shadow part of this opening, right. right? Like we reopen schools that because we want the parents that are like really, because those people are really crunched right now too, especially if, if you're like lower income, you like childcare, good luck finding a daycare, right? Right. And I mean, yeah, it's like, well, that's the, that's one of the reasons we have schools. I mean, it's a good, the salutary reasons is to educate the populace but the bad reasons is to free up their parents for more labor to give to capitalists. And that's actually, that's, that's what this reopen the schools thing is back about to get those parents of those kids back at, back at work. You have Absolutely. no excuse now. Right? I, I mean, they're kind of uh, being plagued by contradictions right now. Right. Because it has a very real toll on the economy, the longer 
that they that people don't go back to work. On the other hand, it will also take a toll on the economy if they do not flatten the curve and the virus continues to ravage through the world. So, uh, it's it's an impo- it's a it's a difficult situation, and you're going to take a hit no matter what you do, as long as we are um, subservient to the logic of the market. 